thank you for having me. This is my uh, first time to Brazil, and the, uh, the experience has been great. Can't wait to come back again. And I'd like to thank the conference organizers. They've been absolutely fantastic. Uh, so thank you for having me here. So my presentation is one that I put together based off of my experience in the, in the US with uh, companies I interact with. A lot of companies in retail, they want to do personalization, as well as in hospitality and financial services. And many of them are asking, well, how do we actually make this work? And one of the things I've done at Best Buy is I've been in charge of personalization, making it actually a successful part of the business, bringing in hundreds of million in new revenue. So a lot of people will come to me and ask, how did you do that? And I ask them, well, how are you setting it up? And they automatically start talking about, well, we have this system we bought, we're using this algorithm. And I realize they're actually focusing on the technology instead of actually the people. So what I've decided to do was build a presentation that showed you a lot of the tools I use to actually make the, the, the project successful. And that's something that you don't often find in the US. There are no classes. There are very few books on personalization. You have to find somebody that's done this before and who knows how to actually put these systems together. So what I'm doing is kind of pulling back the, the covers from what I built and what other companies have built that were successful and showing you what we did. So a little bit about me. Um, this presentation, when I give it at Best Buy, it takes about four hours. So we've got 30 minutes. My personal email is on this slide, so at any time in the future you want to contact me, go ahead, that's going to go straight to me, and I do answer the emails. Some of the things I've also worked on is big data. So that's another hot area right now in the US. I've put together a system that's won some innovation awards for uh, what we've done in retail, put together one of the first Hadoop clusters in, in retail, and that's really one of the backbones I use to uh, put personalization out there. So I just want to level set uh, the situation. A lot of projects right now are failing in terms of delivering what they want to customers. Everybody just says, well, personalization's easy. I've shopped on Amazon. I just go on there, use the recommendation, how hard can this be? So they go out, find a vendor who gives them some, some recommendation tools, they put it out there, they get a nice bump in conversion rate and new sales. Following year they say, okay, so now what do we do to increase that? Well, since they just went to the technology, they don't understand what actually drives the technology. So here's what you end up seeing. One of two models. There's either the Google model or the Facebook model. The Google one is very backwards looking. So you're, you're looking at what people were searching for, what they bought. So at the bottom you have a picture there. You got two bikers. One of them just bought a My Little Pony for his niece, and now he's getting recommendations for My Little Pony. Of course, he's already bought it, so it's useless for him. On the other side, you have the Facebook model, which thinks if we get all the information about somebody, then we'll know exactly what they want. But the problem with the Facebook model is nobody shares everything. When was the last time somebody put their personal medical history on Facebook? Nobody does that. So both models have their weaknesses, and even if you combine both of the strengths of both models, you still would be missing a very vital piece. So before I get to that, that particular piece, what I wanted to do is kind of drill down into how people looked at personalization. The top one is where a lot of companies end up at. They focus on the data. But really, you want to drill down to that bottom one. It's all about the who and then the technology, which is the how. And you need it in that specific order. If you go straight to the technology, I will guarantee you with 100%, you will be going back and fixing the mess that you created. So that third piece that, that's missing is the psychograph self. And that's really the part of the individual that determines what makes them tick. What's gonna get that person to trigger actually buying the product that you're trying to sell to them? 
So that psychograph self is the little nuances that separate us from one another, that makes us individuals. And this is where personalization becomes extremely nuanced and, and very difficult to, uh, to really do on a mass scale if you're just looking at the technology alone. This particular piece here is what really separates everything out. Now, the Facebook part is great because it's the aspirational self that it brings out in people. So when I came to Brazil before coming here, I went on Facebook and I asked my friends, hey, I'm going to Brazil. I've never been to Brazil before. What should I be doing when I'm here? That's the aspirational self coming out. It's also when you see people on Facebook, they're posting pictures, they're at the new cool restaurant, they're at some trendy part of town. That's their aspirational self coming out. You want that because a lot of people will buy off of the aspirations that they have. But also the Google self is really good because it give, it's giving you a window into their train of thought throughout time. Now it's not gonna give you the intent in the here and now, but it will give you some correlations and trends that you can then bank on. Now, some of the tools when you start getting into the psychograph self that uh, I wanted to share with you. Uh, this is how I, I'd go out and I'd disrupt the markets that I go into. So when some executive will say, oh my God, Amazon, they make 60, 65 billion. Yes, they do, but they don't use some of these tools. And these tools are how you can actually beat Amazon or anybody else for that matter. So persuasion profiling. This is what we call the arguments. Now, everybody has what is called an argument set that they gravitate towards. What I mean by an argument is there are certain things that almost every time when you buy anything, you're going to trigger off of. For some people, it's a discount. When the new iPhone comes out and it's being sold at full price, these people do not care. They'll wait and say, if you give me 20% off, I'm interested. On the flip side, you have people that go for the latest trends as an argument. They are the people that are sitting outside the, the Apple stores waiting for that new iPhone because they want the latest whatever. It doesn't matter if it's the latest iPhone, latest shoes, it doesn't matter, they want that. So there's about a dozen different arguments out there and if you can key in on what the argument is for a customer, you know when to send them an email or when to engage them. If somebody's a trend follower, you know when that new iPhone comes out, send them an email. If they want a discount, don't even bother because they're not gonna trigger on that. So you can take the persuasion profiles and then merge that with uh, what we call social graphs. Now the US Army uses that for when they have new recruits. So let's say I signed up to join the Army. The, uh, the Army will then ask for access to my Facebook account. Look at all my friends. If they see that you're a friend of mine and two of your friends along with me have also enlisted recently, you're gonna get a phone call from the US Army because they know that social influence of your friends signing up means your probability of also signing up becomes much higher. So one of the things we looked at was taking Apple and Samsung. If you are an Apple user and you've just moved into a town that is more predominantly Samsung, we'll start sending ads to you about Samsung because we know that social influence of your neighbors, your coworkers is influencing you in terms of what you're interested in looking at for new product purchases. So you're taking the influence plus the persuasion to create uh, an authority in terms of what you're offering to them. That authority is something you can then bank on if you have a high level of trust with the customer. Those two particular aspects can get your conversion rate a few percentage points higher by being able to figure out how to use that social graph with the arguments. And then another one, uh, this is a fun one that is always an interesting one to deal with. So, different times of the day, people have different products that they're interested in. When was the last time anybody heard a liquor ad at eight o'clock in the morning? Yeah, most of us are not thinking about having a tequila at eight o'clock in the morning. 
we're, we're thinking like orange juice or, or, some, or a coffee. But at nighttime, more likely at eight o'clock at night, you probably would see a liquor ad on TV, at least in the US. So our personalities are actually quite fluid throughout the day. <coughs> Excuse me. We're not the same person in our commute going to work as our commute going home. In the morning, we're thinking about that meeting that you have with the boss, the, the presentation you're gonna have to give. On the way home, you're probably thinking, okay, what am I gonna do for dinner with the kids? So that different mindset really changes throughout the day. The type of messages you send to people via instant message or by email should take into account the time of the day in which you're interacting with them. Because the, the way they respond to you will change based on the fluidity of their personality throughout the day. So next I wanna move into uh, how do you deliver this? So at Best Buy, the personalization platform I created, I called it the experience platform. And I named it that intentionally. Nobody buys an Xbox just to have it in their living room. They buy it because it's an experience they wanna have. They're thinking about the games they'll play with their friends. The mom's thinking about how she's gonna be cooking dinner and be able to watch her kids play in the living room and have a family experience that way. So the act of buying should be a good experience too. And that's why I named it that way, to get people's minds wrapped around what it is we're actually trying to do with personalization. It's about experiences. That's really what we're trying to sell here. So how do you do that is really understanding, one, the technology as a communication tool. It's nothing more than that. <coughs> and you gotta deliver value first. I always develop a personalization tool with the idea of what am I giving you as a customer? It's not about what kind of data I'm getting out of you. It's I'm taking this data, doing some kind of uh, analysis on it, and then giving it back to you in some form of a recommendation, some form of a deal. There has to be some sort of value there for you. And that value then develops fans out of your customers, where they'll go out and then promote you more to their friends because they have a, such a great experience with you. Now this is uh, just sort of the one slide I wanted to have in there to, to caution on this one. A lot of companies talk about personalization, just like they talk about omni-channel. So at Best Buy, I work in omni-channel, talk about omni-channel with other companies. Everybody's talking omni-channel, almost nobody's really doing it. Same thing with personalization. People talk about it, but they don't do it. If you do it, that puts you ahead of most of your competitors right off the bat. Now, another thing I like to have uh, when I present out is framing the, the, the areas within personalization. Again, this is a very nuanced area, but you can put it into nice four buckets that explains it out very well. And think of it as a clock. So you start out at the top at noon and you work your way around. So the first thing you need is the strategy. What's the customer and business value? Usually your marketers or someone that has a similar capacity is gonna be working on this. This is where you need to start because without this piece of understanding, why are we even doing this? Everything else ends up becoming a very costly expense. Next, this is a step that a lot of companies end up missing is the social part. You need to have linguists, people who know how to write and communicate to people because a lot of your, your information is gonna be on contextually on screens. You need psychologists, sociologists, people who understand how people react. They're the ones who are gonna look at your customer value and help you understand, is this really something that will resonate, yes or no? Next, you, you need your analysts, the people that are gonna figure out how do we measure success out of this. And then finally, you get to IET. What are the tools we need in place digitally to make this actually work? <coughs> to go along with that, you need to have, what's your vision goals? A lot of times people will set up a big data or a personalization program because they think everybody else is doing it. 
So they go in with the wrong set of goals. They think, well, we need to catch up to everyone else. First start with what is it we're trying to accomplish here for the organization as well as for the customer? And then how do we define success? Have that defined up front. Because when you get to the actual development stage, if you don't know what success means, it ends up becoming failure. After the, the vision, you need to have the governance in place. And this is very important. For me, when I was building personalization, I had merchants, finance, legal, regulatory, security, IT, marketing, human resources, all these different teams because I was touching all these different points within the company. They all have a different perspective you need to take into account. For example, with legal, if you're building algorithms like we were, it's not a matter of if you're going to get sued by somebody, it's a matter of when you're gonna get sued by somebody. Because there are many patents out there, and they all look very similar, but there's all these little nuances. So for example, we had uh, one company try and sue us saying we violated their patent because they said we were taking product recommendations, tying it into inventory levels and using that to create a recommendation. But actually that wasn't true. It was completely based off the behavior of the customer. But for them, it looked like their patent, but showing them that the algorithm was different ended that conversation quickly. But because it's such a gray area, everybody's just testing the waters to see what is legally acceptable in this space to do. And finally, execution. What does that look like? Who do you need involved? No one team can do personalization. It's, it's a lot like digital when it came out. First, you had like a digital department. And then digital, as it grew, you realize you need to touch all these different groups. Well, with an execution, you realize if you're doing it correctly, you need to have the mobile team, the tablet team, the apps team, the main dot com team, customer service, operations, store operations, supply chain, all involved. So how do you execute with those different teams when they all have different roadmaps? And sometimes they, their roadmaps may be longer or shorter. You need to understand that going in right away. So another frame that, that we use is what we call the discovery pipe. So we're trying to look at really how are we gonna develop our personalization strategy over time. So first thing you gotta do, acknowledge the past. There's probably something you're already doing out there that falls into that space. When it comes to personalizations, there's about two dozen different ways <clears throat> to actually personalize. That falls into like email marketing or recommendations or whether you're in the store, you already have employees who know your customers. One of the things I, I always like to point out is that when it comes to personalization, the tools may be new, but what you're doing is as old as selling because all you're doing is going back to like when my great grandfather had a store in New Hampshire where he was interacting with Mrs. Smith who came in every Tuesday to buy milk and bread. He knew that because for him, he had personalized the selling experience. All we're trying to do is replicate that using technology. So understand that we, we all understand personalization at its, at its base level. We're just using new tools. So recognize what's been done in the past, what you also have right now in the present, but then look out to what we call soon. Soon means something that you can develop within six months. Usually if you're looking at just putting in recommendations engines, you can do that within six months. It takes about seven to 10 days to actually write the algorithm for something like customers who bought also bought or customers who viewed also viewed. These are actually very easy to do. And then you put it up, do some A-B testing, and that's something you can easily do within a six-month time frame. Then what's your future? So this is your year-long roadmap. What do you hope to accomplish within your fiscal year? And then your horizon, that's usually your, your three-year roadmap. You have an understanding of where the market's gonna go, but there's still some ebb and flow in terms of how customer choices will change in three years. For example, in 2007, who knew that in 2010, we would be talking about tablets as an experience for shopping? Very few people did. So you have to take into account those kind of things will change. 
But this kind of uh, diagram really helps to get people's ideas down on paper and figure out where does this really fall in terms of when can we accomplish it. And that timing is very important. Also, the other thing is to think about activities. So when it comes to personalization, intent is the key piece everybody's looking for. And intent is always based around an activity. Somebody's coming in to buy a new refrigerator. Is it because the refrigerator broke or are they remodeling? Understanding that activity that they're, that they're experiencing in the moment really helps you understand why they're coming in. Same thing with, uh, with laptops. In August, we have sales for laptops for back to school. Somebody comes in and buys a laptop. Did they buy it to go back to school? Or are they just taking advantage of the sale? Understanding that intent is one of the biggest pieces of personalization everybody's going after. And most personalization models completely fail at understanding intent. I know where you purchase, how, what, and when. But why? I could collect all the data in the world, and 99% of the time, it won't tell me that why. That's where the engagement model and understanding the activities come into play. And that's also where having your employees pull back from hiding behind the technology and engaging the customers really is what separates out good personalization from mediocre personalization. Now, to get to the intent, you have to understand some of the signals. And when it comes to signals, this can get uh, quite tricky. So we spent a lot of time figuring out what are the different signals and how do we really drill them down into easy to understand buckets. So sentiment, this is great for social media. There are a lot of people that buy depending on what mood they're in. People that are in a good mood and like shopping when they're in a good mood, it's great to send them emails when you can see that their sentiment on, on Twitter is very positive. Send them an email for a product, their odds of actually transacting on that are very high. Go into behavior. So you can look at patterns, and once you see somebody's falling into a behavior pattern that they've demonstrated a purchasing tendency towards in the past, you can start triggering sending them emails or giving them product recommendations because you know they're in a cycle where they're probably ready to purchase and you just need them to, to, to go a little bit further. Then events, you know, we already talked a little bit about people coming in like they're, they're needing a new uh, refrigerator. There's also events, we found correlations. If somebody's buying a new home, they're gonna buy consumer electronics. Every industry has these trends around events. You just have to figure out what are the events and find the correlations. And then clusters. As much as we like to be considering ourselves unique, we all have certain traits that are similar to other people. So once we identify a cluster and we place you in that cluster, we can see different patterns within the clusters and see if you're also susceptible to, to a purchase based off of the behaviors of your cluster. And then there's correlations. So that's usually economic data correlation. Uh, also, uh, maybe different natural events, such as Hurricane Sandy. When that came through the, the east coast of the US, my team, we did an analysis. What are some products that people are buying or looking for when a hurricane comes into town that they normally don't look for? So we look for some low traffic products like weather radios. Usually gets about 50 hits a day. Hurricane Sandy came in, thousands of people were looking for them. So those are the kind of uh, correlations you can find within the data, seeing like what kind of events are happening that are influencing people's decisions that are external from their own personal uh, behavioral patterns. And then next, uh, the, way, the way things have been changing, some of you may have been hearing about data science, big data. Those are things that I've spent a lot of time working in. I don't really see those as replacing analysts, but more as augmenting our analytical skills. And it's not an area that I see that it's gonna be a specialized skill, it's gonna be something we all need. We're all gonna to have to be able to use our intuition to look at the data, because you'll often hear people say, well, let the data speak. 
but the data was collected and refined by somebody with biases and judgments. You need to put your own lens on it out of your own experience to understand was this data interpreted properly or not? So you can't really let the data speak because sometimes the data isn't really speaking, it's somebody else doing the speaking for it. And from that, you can get uh, out of the data some, some things like human motion graphs, which I won't go into too much here because I know we're running out of time. But these are some of the analyses that we would do, just trying to see where people were going and where those patterns were and what we could then gleam off of that in terms of their behavior. Now, this may not seem personal because you're looking at a lot of data around lots of people, but again, people are creatures of habit. So once you start noticing the patterns, you can take something that looks personal and give it a personal feel. And a lot of people will gravitate towards it and use that information. Now, we call these people you know, some people call them Generation Y. We'd call them data discoverers. Data discoverers are a new type of customer out there. They love data. So I don't know if any of you have a Fitbit. It's a little device you wear to track your fitness levels. I have some relatives that have this. What you see is a uh, dashboard for Fitbit. It tells you how much you worked out, how intense was it, what kind of goals you met, and people go nuts for this. They love analyzing their own data. And you're gonna see this more and more, that people want to have their data. And you can start personalizing with their own data. Whereas in the past, you used to just collect it yourself and then give them a recommendation. Giving them dashboards like this is another way to engage your customer. Giving them feedback on their purchases and like warranty plans that they were buying and showing when they expired and when they could get renewed ones. Giving people that kind of data, we saw them engaging with us much more and also buying these, these service plans at a higher rate than if we didn't share this kind of data with them. So Macy's does, uh, you know, if you were to ask me an example of one company that does some good personalization, I would say look at Macy's. Now, they don't always scale everything they do, but they do a lot of experimenting. So if there's a company in the US I would recommend watching, it would be Macy's, just to see the experiments that they do. Also, if you're looking to engage customers, I, I tend to stay away from Facebook. I find it a low engagement. It's a long tail uh, channel. But there are other channels like Vine. It, you have these six second videos, which doesn't sound like a lot, but you'd be amazed how creative people get with six seconds of video. Also with Tumblr, a lot of the 20 somethings, college kids, they're into Tumblr. It's very quick, very short. Same thing with Twitter. These, these short attention span channels are becoming the new area where you can engage customers and personalize the experiences for them. So if you're looking to get into the social space, I would recommend these channels to start uh, engaging them more than, more than Facebook. And if there's one thing that you walk away with that I, that I hope everybody understands, it's data insights action. You gotta collect the data, define it, figure out where it's coming from. You have to get the insights out of it, which isn't always easy. And then you have to actually do something off of that. And that's where a lot of companies fall short. A lot of companies are excellent at collecting data. They're pretty good at the insights. Very few are very good at the action piece. So again, if you want to have a competitive advantage, get to the action piece faster than your competitors. Because whoever gets the action piece first usually wins. That's why Amazon is usually credited so often. They were first at a lot of these spaces. And then here's just another framework that we use because you will have a lot of competing interests within your organization around what's important. So we have a business values framework that kind of helps define what really is important, what should we focus on, what should we give customers. And then remember that data is a commodity and that the action based on wisdom is the scarce resource. Again, don't let the data do the talking, really understand it. I'm considered the business owner. My job is to make the ROI good, make money. 
I understand Hadoop. I understand data science. I understand R and the different programming languages. Why? Because I understand that knowing these tools is gonna help me be a better business owner. If you don't know the tools your team's using, you'll never know really how to take advantage of their skill set. Then here's just an example I put up for different companies and what they're doing in the market. Of course, this is focused on retail. My recommendation is if you're a retailer like, like me, actually look outside your space. I talk to companies like Medtronics, which is a medical device company. Talk to Honeywell, they do air conditioning units, which they're actually looking at personalizing the, the in-home environment. So talk to the different companies outside your space. You'll find they're more willing to talk to you than those in your space just because you're not a competitive threat to them. And also, here are some common quick wins. So when I built personalization, these were actually the four areas I focused in on saying, in year one, this is what we're going to do. So personalize everywhere. So, you know, like mobile, e-commerce, customer service. Then have a data repository where you store everything. You're gonna be collecting way more data than you probably imagine you will. I thought we'd get two petabytes of data. Yeah, we blew that out of the water pretty quick. Then also have uh, across different channels. That's why you start getting into the physical, as well as also get into marketing. So even though this is sometimes seen as an operational piece, it truly is a marketing tool that you can use with like the email marketing, in-store promos, and so on. And then have a team that is truly developed for personalization. So you're going to need the business person, the social, the IT, and the analytics. Now, the phrase I have at the top is because data science is often seen as a discipline separate from everything else. I spent two years trying to learn data science, and at the end of it, I learned this is something we all have to do as business owners, is understand how to use the data and then how to get that data in the hands of our customers. So data science is really not a discipline, but a tool that we all use. Then finally, here are just some numbers in terms of what I saw as growth. So your average conversion rate for retail is 3.5% in the US. I was getting as much as 15% return on personalization. Also, we saw AOV, people spending more time on the site, people engaging us more. So the results from the number side speak quite clearly. And with that, I know we're over time, so I just want to like jump into questions.